Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. It reads as follows. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as a need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their fruit with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Nesefo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as elder and pastor. And this morning, I have the privilege of opening up God's word for us. As a church, we are journeying in a series geared towards covenant commitment. What is covenant commitment? Covenant commitment is an opportunity to commit to the vision of Fellowship City and to participate in the ministry of the church in a specific way for 12 months. The vision of the church is seeing God's kingdom come by transformed lives living in and through his transcultural church. This is an invitation to participate, church family. To participate in the vision of Fellowship City and the ministry initiatives and life of the church for the next 12 months. The 12 months starts today. We launched and have a Google form that you can use to sign up, which has all the information we have been sharing and will continue to share for the month of June. So after the service, you will find a QR code that you can scan at the back with the host. I will be there as well if you do have any questions. So what is the importance of this? Why does it seem like we're making a big deal? This is because as a transcultural church, we're aware that we have people from different church backgrounds and contexts and experiences. If we mention the word membership, different people have different ideas and different expressions of what that means. We purposely chose a different word because we envision something slightly different, a commitment to five specific things only for a period of 12 months and we have articulated those five things and we'll continue to articulate them this morning. This is what we're asking people to commit to. These are the five things. Supporting the vision of Fellowship City, participating in a ministry, discipleship, and fellowship spaces of Fellowship City, serving in the church through time and talents, giving treasures generously and consistently, and being accountable to the church family who are on this journey together. The sign-up process starts today, as I mentioned, and closes on the 7th of July. The reason it closes on the 7th of July is to enable us to plan and communicate, particularly the discipleship spaces and the serving spaces that will start from July on. It does not mean that you can't sign up after July. It just means that you may have to wait a little bit longer as we organize a discipleship or serving space for you to join. I'm going to be covering some of those uh, discipleship spaces and serving spaces will be covered in the next week. We've already had two sermons in our series of covenant commitment, one supporting the vision. So if you want to hear more clearly that vision, you can catch that sermon on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. This morning we focus on point two of the five, participating in discipleship. This is a picture of Tiger Woods. Those that don't know him, he's a golfer who has achieved great heights in golf. Tiger Woods as a young boy was introduced to the sport of golf by his father, Earl Woods, who was a former athlete and a single digit handicapped golfer. In golf, the handicap is a grading and measure of how good you are. The smaller the handicap number, the more it indicates your ability within the sport of golf. Tiger Woods' father, Earl Woods, was Tiger's mentor from an early formative years of golf. Um, Earl Woods provided constant guidance constant encouragement, and constant training. By the age of three, Tiger Woods was showcasing unbelievable talent because of the immersion in golf. 
live, breathe, and sweat golf. His routine included hitting balls at the driving range, playing rounds of golf, and working on his short game. You will see an image of that short game as the ball flies out of the sand in the image that is there. Tiger Woods' life revolved around golf. He sacrificed typical childhood activities and socializing to form and focus on his practice and craft. This is a picture of Zarele Zodala. She's a South African netball player who played in the Commonwealth Games in 2006, 2010, and 2014. She played for the better or the true pro tiers, let me say that, uh, the, pro, the spa pro tiers. Um, she was born in Port Elizabeth and she showed a keen interest in the sport, particularly netball. So Zanele dedicated uh, dedication to netball involved rigorous training and practice. She invested countless hours in improving her technique, her fitness, and her game understanding. She immersed herself in netball. Zanele's Christian faith played a pivotal role in her life. Her upbringing in a Christian family laid a strong spiritual foundation which she leaned on throughout her career. As she faced the presence and challenges of the eSports, Zanella's faith deepened. She often turned to prayer and Bible study for strength and guidance. Beyond her role as a player, Zanella dedicated herself to mentoring young athletes. She emphasized the importance of faith, discipline, perseverance, guiding them in both sports and personal life. Zanella became an advocate for women's rights and great opportunities in sports. Her faith-driven belief in equality and empowerment fueled her advocacy work. What should be clear in both the examples of Tiger Woods and Zanella is that being fully immersed in something transforms the individual into the direction of what they are immersed in. Being fully immersed in something transforms the life of the individual into the direction of what they are immersed in. That a change happened in their lives when they understood something about themselves and understood something about the craft that they were interested in. The direction of their lives changed. They lived, ate, and slept the sport. They were mentored and they were guided by others that went before them. They were fully in. They also lived in a life through the lens of discipleship towards their craft, which changed their lives. We will see today as we look at both Acts 2, verse 42 to 47, what Zimmy read for us. We'll also look at Matthew 28, 16. Acts 2 verse 42 is our main passage in our Covenant Commitment series. We believe that this passage is a perfect expression of the church. We see how the church is built up together, how the church should look from the lens of Acts 2 verse 42 to 47. We see a great picture of life on life paradigm, where those who follow or those who are followers of Jesus prioritize fellowship and discipleship. In Acts 2 verse 42, we see, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is a picture of life on life, which looks like this. Every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple, broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This also has a picture of disciples. It has a essence of life and life approach of being in community being immersed in teaching and fellowship which should help us to live outwardly looking lives and serving one another we see a similar picture in Zanella with Dr. Ola how she, how the gospel transformed her life and shaped her desire to serve and give of herself this morning we will look at Matthew 28, 16-20 which speaks about discipleship, three points this morning what is discipleship, the authority of Jesus in the command of that discipleship, and what are we called to, and how do we do it? For those who are hungry, brace yourselves, we will also talk about the perfect sandwich and making eggs. But let's pray as we get into God's word. Lord, we thank you that we, um, your people, can come before your throne to sing songs of praise and worship to you, to meet and encounter you through your spirit as you move among us. We thank you that now we can come to sit under the authority of your word. I pray that as I speak, that your people would hear your voice, that your Holy Spirit would be at work. Your Holy Spirit would be touching our hearts and minds and helping us to focus on you. I pray that you be with us here this morning by your spirit. That you transform us by the word that you have for us. Would you speak? 
speak to us. Those things that we want to know to say and to do. And may the meditation of heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. What is discipleship? And it's our first point. The word discipleship is a word often spoken about within church spaces. Often the word is used by individuals who have been in church spaces a little bit longer. But what does the word discipleship mean? How can we collectively understand the word discipleship? The word discipleship doesn't appear in the New Testament. However, however the concept of discipleship comes from the root word disciple. Disciple in the Greek is the word matateias, which generally refers to a student or apprentice or a follower. In the New Testament, the word disciple appears 269 times. One of the instances we see the word disciple is in Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. There are two mentions of the word disciple in this passage and one essence of discipleship, which we'll see from this passage. Verse 16 of Matthew 28 reads as follows, all the way to 23. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is a well-known part of Scripture, mostly referred to as the Great Commission. Jesus is part, Jesus in this part of Scripture gives a command to his disciples, those who called or he called to himself, those who have put their faith and trust in him. The command is based on the authority that Jesus has both in heaven and on earth. When we see the command to make disciples, we have to first see that the giver of the command is sovereign. He has all the authority in heaven and earth to give this command, and importantly, to support this command that he gives to those he has called. We have to be immersed in this truth about the sovereignty and authority of the command giver first before we're able to go and make disciples of all nations. This truth has to saturate our hearts and minds it has to not only be theology, but it has to be an enlightenment, or an enlightenment in our hearts, which enables us to understand the command and live in it. Our second point is the authority of Jesus and the command for discipleship. Let's start with the most pressing question. Jesus says all authority has been given to him. So who gave him authority? That's a great question. A few verses before in Matthew 11, verse 27, we see the answer, or we see one of the answers. And it says, all things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal himself. There are a couple of other passages which speak about who gives Jesus authority. But in John 17 verse 2, we see the same sentiment as from Matthew, but one that is more fitting to the context we see in Matthew 28 verse 18. John 17 from verse 1 says, this is what Jesus prayed as he looked up into heaven. Father, the time has come. Unveil the glorious splendor of your Son so that I will magnify your glory. You have already given me authority over all people so that I may give the gift of eternal life to all those that you have given to me. Eternal life means to know and experience you as the only true God and to know and experience Jesus Christ as the Son whom you have sent. Many of you will know that I shake at the sight of the exclamation mark. You will know that it is one you may never see on a text coming from me. If you have received an exclamation mark from me, it would have been followed by an apology. Um, however, a fitting placement for the exclamation mark is in this passage. To show the strength of the statement, unveil the glorious splendor of your son so that I may magnify your glory. So how does Jesus magnify the glory of God the Father? giving the gift of eternal life and redeeming the broken relationship between God the Father and those that receive the gift. I love the addition of the word gift in the Passion Translation. Jesus freely gives this gift of eternal life. Eternal life means to know God and to experience God as the only true God and to know and experience Jesus Christ as the Son whom God has sent. In Matthew 28 verse 18 we see the mention of authority in heaven and on earth. The Father knows the sheep. The Father knows those who belong to him. Verse 
to those that you have given to me. That's what we see in verse 2 of John 17. God the Father gives the Son authority to give life to the sheep. In verse 2, to give the gift of eternal life to all those you have given me. This is the mission of the church. To teach Christ crucified so that Jesus in his death and resurrection reconciles us back to God the Father. Jesus has all authority to heaven given by God on earth to call his sheep back to himself. How does Jesus do that? Jesus comes in the form of a baby in a manger born the perfect birth from a virgin mother Mary. He lives a perfect sinless life. Dies a shameful death. Jesus is beaten severely with a whip that has bone and metal in it. As they whip, they rip his back and his head open. Jesus is spat on and has a crown of thorns placed on his head. Jesus carries a cross on his already beaten and broken back to the top of a mountain where he is placed on that cross. Nails that are square in shape and length of a size nine shoe are smashed through his hands so deep that they hold him to the cross. This means the nails were hammered more than once through his skin and into this wood to hold him up. The nails are not smooth and round, but they're square, which shows how painful that these nails were. The pain of beating and ripped skin and the pain of him being suspended on the cross rips through his body. To find relief, he has to use his feet and use his hands to prop himself up. But ultimately to slouch back down again to give his relief back to his hands and his feet. His breathing labor, the sponge used by the Roman soldiers to clean themselves, is used to give Jesus water in a vinegar mixture. Jesus is stabbed on the side with a spear. Jesus stays on the cross, taking our place and facing the wrath of God for the sins we commit. We are born into sin because of what we see in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve disobey God and want to be king in their own lives. This is us at every opportunity before we know Jesus. We would need to face the punishment for our sins. Our sins are rejecting God. We believe we know better. We believe we know everything and can do everything. We are boastful and proud. We are arrogant and we see ourselves as kings and queens in our own lives before we know Jesus. It is much the same as the teacup and saucer saying to the potter, I know how best to hold the liquid inside me. The pinky should be extended when you hold me. Only five roses goes inside me. It's the same as the saucer saying, I don't let any liquid fall off the cup onto the floor. I can hold it all. The tea cup and the saucer beat their chest at the thought of their own power. This is but a glimpse of our rebellion and rejection of God the Father, God our Maker. Instead of facing the wrath of our rebellion or rejection, Jesus dies for you and for me on that cross. In our place. Jesus in three days is resurrected. The tomb stone is rolled away and it is empty. Jesus is risen in his death and resurrection, in his conquering of death, in his completion of the mission to reunite us back to God the Father. Jesus, who is human and God, is at that point given the authority to give eternal life. Just to be clear, Jesus has gone always had authority, but Jesus who came to earth had the perfect birth, life, death, and resurrection. Jesus, who is both man and God, Jesus who conquered death in his role as God and man here on earth is given the authority by God the Father to give the gift of eternal life through his sacrifice on the cross. In his role as a conquering God who died and rose again in three days, in his role as man who lived on this earth, he is given the authority at that point when he conquers death give eternal life and to reunite us back to God the Father. What is the authority that is given to Jesus? We see in John 17 that the authority includes giving the gift of eternal life. This giving of eternal life is calling to those that are his so they hear and know him as God. 
In the giving of eternal life, we know that there is forgiveness of sins. Jesus has all the authority to forgive sins. There is no depth of sin in which we can be disqualified from the authority of God to forgive and save us. Here's a quote from Charles Spurgeon. God's mercy is so great that you may sooner drain the sea of its water or deprive the sun of its light or make space too narrow than diminish the great mercy of God. No sin is too great for God's mercy and no sinner is too far from his grace. The authority is also over death and hell. In Jesus' death on the cross, he conquered death. Death has no sting. In death we rise and we, re we reign with God. In death we are reunited with God and all the saints who have victory already in heaven with God. Our third point, what are we called to do? And how do we do it? In the authority of God, in the sovereignty of God, He calls us, wakes us, and empowers us to live a life of discipleship. In Matthew 28, there are four verbs. So you don't only get to learn the Bible, every now and then we throw some English on the pulpit. A verb is a word used to describe an action, a state, occurrence, and forming the main part of a sentence. The four verbs are what we should be doing the actions, but also the verbs indicate occurrence, or rather indicate how we should be doing it. So the four verbs are go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Those are the four verbs we see in Matthew 28. The main verb in Matthew 28, 19 to 20 is make disciples. And the other three verbs tell us how we ought to make the disciples. The how is seen in the other three verbs. So go, which indicates motion or activity, doing something. So we need to participate. We need to be active in order to make disciples. That's one part of the way we make disciples. We go, we are active, and we participate. Baptize is the other verb that indicates how we make disciples. We practice baptism as one of the sacraments as a church regularly. This morning we practiced communion. Baptism is a practice that, that, that follows of Jesus participate in to publicly declare their belief in Jesus. Baptism is significant in the spiritual cleansing, which is the washing away of sin and beginning a new life in Christ. Baptism is an act of obedience, as we see in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 18. We ought to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The third verb, which speaks about how we make disciples, is teaching. Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. So making disciples is not only seeing people converted or people moving from darkness to light, which is conversion, or seeing people move from not knowing God to knowing God, which is conversion. Making disciples is not only baptizing people. Conversion, which is the making of disciples, and baptizing people are essential, but so is the ongoing teaching of what Jesus taught. That's what we see in Matthew 28. The new life of a disciple is a life of obedience to Jesus' command. The new life of a disciple is a life of obedience to Jesus' commands. Or it is not a new life at all. Tiger Woods' discipleship in the game of golf was, was not in knowing golf as a sport played by his father. That wasn't his discipleship. He was prioritizing and changing his life, reorienting his life. He was continuously teaching himself and being taught by others. As a professional golfer, Tiger would still look and learn from others daily. As a serial winner, he still looked and learned from others daily. So he was immersed in his identity as a golfer. The new life of a disciple is in prioritizing and putting God first. It is an oxymoron to be a disciple but not to obey the commands of God. Oxymoron is a figure of speech in which apparently contradictory terms appear in conjunction together. It is an oxymoron to acknowledge Jesus as Lord and then ignore his commands. These are contradictory terms. You cannot say you know Jesus, but then you don't know his commands. You don't live within his commands. Or you ignore his commands. Barbara Boyd was an elementary school teacher in Canada. 
who attended Bible school and joined campus ministry to teach about Jesus. She has an illustration that shows the nature of how a disciple should be a full disciple of Jesus. She says this, if somebody says to me, come on in, Barbara, but stay out, boy, there's a bit of a problem because I can't separate them. It's not like the top of me is Barbara and the bottom half of me is boy. So if you won't have boy, you can't have Barbara. If you're going to keep the boy out, I can't come in at all. To say, Jesus, come into my life, forgive my sins, answer my prayers, do this for me, do that for me, but don't be the absolute master of my life. Jesus, Savior, come in, but Lord, stay out. How can you come in at all? How can you come in at all? Because he's all Savior and he's all Lord. He's Lord because he's Savior and he's Savior because he's Lord. If we are his disciples, if we know God because he has called us to himself, then we listen and we obey his word. In Matthew 28, we see that we ought to be disciple makers and we ought to be continually learning in our discipleship. Teaching is a continuous participle. It is not a once done action. These four verbs which are given by Jesus are given by Jesus because Jesus has authority to give the gift of eternal life and to save the lost. Jesus calls his sheep that know and hear his voice and gives them eternal life and forgives them their sins. So Jesus has authority to do this. Our part is to teach and to share Jesus so that Jesus calls those he knows to himself. We see this in the function of the word, therefore. In verses 19. Therefore is a conjunctive adverb. I promise it's the last English lesson for this morning. Therefore is a conjunctive adverb that joins two ideas from two dependent sentences. We make disciples, we baptize, we are active and teach continuously because as a result of who Jesus is and his authority in heaven and earth. Authority to give the gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins and call people to himself. So in the four verbs, we see two forms of discipleship. The making of disciples, and the second form is in, found is in, in verse 20, which is the ongoing continuous teaching. So there's two forms, the making of disciples and the ongoing continuous teaching. We are called to participate in these two types and forms of discipleship through the four verbs of go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Here's a great comfort and a source of strength. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus says he's always with us, so we aren't making disciples alone. We aren't teaching people to obey Jesus in a vacuum. We can't make people obey Jesus. We teach and we make disciples knowing that God is with us and works by his power to make disciples and to transform lives. God also empowers us through the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit living in us and enabling us to continue living in the command of the Great Commission. The Holy Spirit enables us to participate in discipleship. HC has this uh, burger slash sandwich, which comes back every few years. It's called the Double Down. Uh, bear with me here. It is chicken with cheese, sauce, and smoked chicken slice. Dare I say it's a carbless burger? I think it's a near perfect sandwich. Near perfect because it doesn't have the modest egg. Um, but, but think about this. Think about this picture. We participate in discipleship remembering that we're in the middle of two wonders and promises. In this burger, we see meat at the top, meat at the bottom. We see some meat in the middle and cheese and sauce. We participate in discipleship knowing that we're in the middle of two promises, two wonderful promises. We are sandwiched between these wonderful promises, like we see in the call of discipleship. We participate in discipleship knowing that the absolute authority and power of Jesus helps us to witness and has the power to make disciples make disciples. He calls people to himself and gives the gift of eternal life. All we do is teach, baptize, or point them to Jesus. That is the top of the sandwich. The top which is glorious. That he gives authority. He's the one with authority. And we teach. And here's the bottom. Also as glorious. The bottom is the promise of the constant presence of God. He is with us until the end of the age. All we have to do is teach, baptize, make disciples. For he has authority to make disciples and call people to himself. And he is with us and he is the one who does glory. Let me
me give us an illustration of how easy and natural discipleship is. So we have come to know that discipleship is teaching and proclaiming Christ so that others know and are converted. Discipleship is the continuous teaching which helps us to grow and obey the command of God. So an illustration of this is an egg. I know some of you have been waiting for a while for this. I know eggs poor that are polarized families, um, where some people don't eat eggs, or some people only eat them made in a certain way. Um, we don't get, we're not going to get into which is the best way to have it this morning. Um, we'll leave that for later. I'm using eggs because of how natural it is, and also that the next time we make or enjoy eggs, we think about discipleship. Think of how easy it is to make eggs and how easy it is to be disciple making. So that the next time you enjoy eggs, you remember how important the discipleship lifestyle is. So how is discipleship like making eggs, you ask? That's a great question. There are two parts to it. There is the making of eggs. You can make them in different ways. And there's the continuous enjoyment of making eggs and enjoying eggs. There are many different ways to make disciples. We preach, we teach evangelism and counseling. There are many different ways of making eggs. Poached, boiled, scrambled, in an omelet. In the continuous making of eggs, you become better and you enjoy eating eggs more. Eggs are good for us. A good source of protein. Eggs have good cholesterol. Eggs have vitamin D, E, and B. Much in the same as the continuous discipleship, continuous discipleship is good for the individual, but also good for those around the individual. This is like the continuous teaching. As we are continuously in teaching in discipleship spaces, we learn more about the Christian faith. We learn how to apply the Christian faith to every situation and learn the right perspectives and enjoy life. We learn to put off the bad and replace with the good. We satisfy ourselves with the truth. So individual reading and corporate reading and apply God's word. Second, it seems hard until you make them. So discipleship may seem hard until you start. Many people think it's hard to make eggs until they've made some. This is the same as discipleship. It seems hard if you have not maybe been in a discipleship space or a discipleship um, community, or it seems hard unless you've been vulnerable or maybe afraid that you might fail. Here's another one. Even if you have all the tools you need, it still seems hard. When you first made eggs, you, you would have needed some equipment, maybe a pan, olive oil, maybe some onions and milk, the continuous learning individual. I know that uh, peppers has popped in someone's mind, but let's not go there now. I would still, it would still seem hard with the equipment that you have to make eggs. Well, we have God's word as our equipment as disciples of God. We saw in Matthew 28, God says that we must teach what he has taught us. So we are learning while we are doing life and teaching others. We also have his promises that he will be with us. Making your first egg would have been easier if someone more experienced was there with you. God says that he is with us there all the time. And in discipleship spaces, you have others around you who have walked the journey as well. Making it easier and more enjoyable. It gets easier the more you make them. Like with discipleship, it gets easier. You build a muscle for it. You see that it's not as hard as you thought. You enjoy the space of discipleship. You enjoy the learning. Same eggs as you make them, you enjoy them. When you make that omelette or poached egg, maybe even after having built that muscle for making eggs, you grow in trust that you can make more eggs. The same with discipleship. As you disciple or in discipleship spaces, you grow in more trust and faith that you can be in discipleship spaces and disciple others. It can get messy, but it's okay. And it's still good. Much like discipleship, it can get messy. When people are in your space doing life together, they may see how you like to take a taxi cutting in. They may see that your home isn't as clean, that you leave shoes everywhere, including under the couch or table. So please don't look under the table or couch when you visit our home. I'm not saying there's shoes there. Um, making eggs can also get messy. When you try to make a soft, sunny side egg and it breaks in the pan, or the omelet sticking in the pan, or the egg in a ring, not keeping the egg in that round shape. Even though the omelet stuck a bit to the pan or the side egg broke, it still tastes good. 
Same with disciples, if it can get messengers, we let people in. Or as we try to organize space and time to do life. But just do it. Just do it. Enjoy it. Just participate. And it will be good. It can be enjoyed in many different ways. As I've said before, eggs can be enjoyed in many different ways. So can discipleship. It's not just reading the Bible when we read the Bible. It's not just socializing when we socialize. It's not just accountability, even though we're accountable to one another. It's life on life, life on mission, and life in community. As a church, we believe in creating spaces for discipleship that enable both the conversion of people and the continuous teaching and building up of people. We create spaces for fellowship. This may not be the first time you've heard this word. These fellowship spaces include events such as Light a Fire, a space to invite friends after church, to see and experience the real community of brothers and sisters in Christ. A space where we can continue to fellowship and break bread and pray. A space where we can make the circle bigger so people can see a glimpse of what it's like to be part of a family of believers. Fellowship spaces also include eat and run. A space where we can do life together. A space where we can fellowship and break bread. Where we can get to know one another as a family of believers. We have fellowship spaces within our men's and women's ministries. We're going to see a video now from someone who participated in the men's breakfast space. Hello, everyone. I'm Mzwa Kezim. 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 But everyone knows me simply as Mzwa and I want to share my experience in the men's discipleship ministry, specifically around the men's breakfasts. Being part of the men's breakfasts has allowed me to build relationships with other men in the church outside of our usual roles in life. On Sundays, we are men who are brothers, fathers, sons, and husbands, but men's breakfasts have given us the space to meet each other simply as men. While the teachings at these breakfasts has been excellent, what I appreciate even more is the space for deliberate meditation and prayer over the teachings. Connecting with other men afterwards provides a valuable opportunity to sharpen one another. I've found these breakfasts to be a wonderful way to connect with the body of Christ. So if you're not feeling fully connected, I encourage you to join us at the next one. And of course, the bonus is that there's free food. Through our men's breakfast, we gather together as men. We are taught about principles that help us to grow in our identity as men. And we obviously eat, as we just heard Rosie say. Our women's ministry space called Song has event spaces which are focused on creating opportunities to invite new people, to see and experience people who love God and love people. Participating in discipleship means participating in these spaces, inviting someone that you know, that you are praying for and trusting God will bring into their life. Participating in these spaces means making yourself available to meet and fellowship and do life with others. We desire to create one church-wide fellowship space a quarter and one men or Sonke gathering space as well for a quarter. So there's enough spaces to fellowship, to invite people, to make the circle bigger as we continue making this happen to make this happen. So participating in discipleship means participating in fellowship spaces, and it also means participating in teaching spaces. We have D groups. A D group is where three or four same gender individuals meet together. Now let's watch a short video from two people who participate in these spaces. Good morning. My name is Marie Mayer, and I would love to tell you a little bit more about discipleship groups, or D groups, like we call them in Fellowship City. Becoming part of a D group this year has been life changing. I have the privilege of leading a D group uh, together with two other wonderful ladies. We are all moms in our D group, so we might do things a little bit differently to other D groups, but we are currently working through a motherhood podcast series. And that has really been so edifying to be able to listen more about motherhood from someone else, but then to be able to apply those truths into our own lives and to share them with one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another. When the going gets tough, when life is easy, through everything, through the thick and the thin. And it's really been such an honor to be able to do life with these ladies and to learn from them. 
I think the biggest thing that I've learned this year is that you can become friends with people who you never thought you would become friends with. But what an honor to have God orchestrate all of this in our D group and to be able to do life together. If you are considering becoming part of a D group, go for it. It's the best decision that you'll make. Hi, my name is Mpodu Motorada and I'd like to share with you my personal experience with Disciple Group. Um, Disciple Group for me has personally been a very deep experience connecting with other brothers in Christ. Um, and you know, I only when I think of getting together as men, too often it can sometimes get quite shallow where we're just talking about politics and sports, but within D Group we do do that. We do have fun times of course, but it's also been a space where we really can be vulnerable and learn the word of God, learn what it means uh, to be a man in, 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 in the body of Christ. But yeah, but also go a bit deeper to some of our challenges, to where we act, to even the word, our walk with Christ, and even having fun. I mean, to give an example, in our D group, we took our families camping amongst us, which was a lot of uh, fun. But yeah, but that's been D group. It's been a great experience. It's one of yeah, my favorite things. Every Tuesday, I look forward not only to getting away from the house sometimes, but I look forward to engaging with my brothers. So yeah, that's D group. Bye. Two D groups, we read the Bible or biblical books which help us to encourage one another in our walk with Jesus. Which either rebuke or connect maybe some perspectives we may have about the Christian faith. Which helps us to bring the gospel to real world pressures and situations we face. In these spaces, we deal with topics that the group may be grappling with. Uh, biblical manhood, parenting, and many others. We help one another learn how to handle and read the Word of God, to understand it and to be transformed by it. We read the Bible and help each other build the right rhythms. We pray together. We also have spaces which we are calling growth groups in our discipleship spaces. You will hear more of this term, growth groups, in the next few weeks. A growth group is a space or communal, uh, uh, commonality geared space towards helping the believer grow. Our growth groups will be a year commitment, then we will review and maybe renew or change the groups. We previously had city groups which were different, where we had some family focused city groups and other city groups which were more hybrid. We no longer will have city groups in its current form, but we will have what we call growth groups. So some of the growth group spaces will be focused on marriage. We will have smaller groups of married families who will do life together, meeting either bi-weekly or monthly with the intention of growing and developing as individuals, but also growing within the space of marriage and parenting. These will be smaller spaces so we can practically work on how we love our partners, how we strengthen our marriages. We see marriage as a space that is constantly under the attack of the evil one. And if we don't develop or strengthen our marriages, we have in the church where we are loving one another well. Some of the growth groups may have a smaller parenting focus rather than marriage and this means a lot more teaching on individual growth and teaching on how to raise our kids well. These spaces like the marriage spaces will need and include our kids so that's the structure of the group. So both marriage growth groups and parenting growth groups will be family orientated because we will meet together as families but we'll be working through specific common things that we want to grow in whether from the marriage or the parenting space. These will be the first types of growth groups we are creating and trusting God desires for us to create. And trusting God will bring people who desire to do life together in these spaces and desire to learn and be disciples in these spaces. There will be more spaces as we see the need within our group or within our church. We will also have young adults. This is a growth group and it's not a, this, this is a, a group this is not a growth group. Um, we, we view this more as a space to invite other people, whereas a growth group is for people that have committed to be part of Fellowship City for 12 years. Just like our teens' culture space, we desire for our young adults to have a space where they can bring people, bring their friends, a space where they can do life, a space where they can be encouraged, a space where they can learn more about God's Word. It will be for individuals from age from 19 till 32, married but without kids. This means you could be married and still be part of young adults. But the moment you have kids, then you graduate out of the space. 
this ministry will be a great place to invite young adults in our community, a space to learn more about Jesus. We will have worship, we will have singing in this space, we will have food. We see in action that this is important, so we will eat together, we will have talks. There will be a strong focus on apologetics, on how the gospel applies or impacts our life. Because this is important for young adults within our space. And this space will start in July. We desire to see young adults grappling with life and flourishing in their identity as children of God. We will also have and will run discipleship courses. These will be short courses that are geared towards teaching and equipping our people in specific ways. These will be courses like APES. You would have heard Raymo speak last week about it. APES is basically the lower level of gifts that we believe everyone would have. So some of God would have called to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds and teachers. And we all have one or other of these gifts as the base of all gifts. So at the current moment, we're running two courses for our apostles and our prophets, people who've already taken the test because they've been part of fellowship city for longer. But in the third and fourth quarter of this year, we will run another course for APS for those that want to discover their gift and know how to play and participate within the life of their church, knowing the gift that God has entrusted them with. We'll also have courses like Foundations, which speak about the Christian faith, for those that want to refresh about the basics of the Christian faith. So we will have courses, we will have discipleship growth group spaces, we will have um, fellowship spaces, we will also have discipleship spaces for our team. So some of our teams that are slightly older will have the opportunity to meet with some older folk that can be discipled by those folk because we believe discipleship spaces are important. All of our discipleship spaces are geared towards achieving our vision seeing God's kingdom come by transforming lives in and through his transcultural church. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we um, know that you are Lord, that you are God, and that you call us to relationship with yourself. We thank you that you will, by your Holy Spirit, to transform us in the likeness of Christ. We thank you for spaces which you desire to have for your people to be discipled continuously as they become more and more like Christ. We pray that we will all see and understand that you have the authority. You have all the authority in heaven and earth. We pray that we will all know and see 